Hello and welcome to Pictorial Planet. My name's John Finch. Today we're going to be looking at how I took that photograph last week of the flower in the vase. I think it's really interesting to you guys just to see how I set that up. It's really easy and I encourage you to do it yourselves at home. Try it out. See what you can come up with as well. It's a really interesting idea of how to take the picture of the developer I used how I did that. Uh, there's a few tips along the way, um, right to the very end where I talk about the prints themselves. So don't bug out early, stay with me through the video and just see how it turned out. It's great to see you. Thank you for joining me. Let's go over and see my setup now. To take the photograph, it's a very straightforward setup. So I encourage you to have a go at this yourselves at home. I've come outside because the light is even. We're overcast today. It's a nice, soft, even lighting for the flowers. And think about your subjects when you're thinking about the light. What kind of light do you want for your subject? I took a photograph a few videos ago of a watch and uh, I needed a harder light for the watch. I've done other photographs of similar things like the internals of a watch inside with soft light coming through a window. Um, and today with these clouds, it's perfect for the softness of these flower petals. There's a lot of tonality in these flowers and I want to capture all of that or as much as I possibly can. So I've got my backdrop set up here. It's a, a black piece. This is actually the car blanket for the dog. Um, the actual piece I used for the photograph, I can't use today because my wife's wearing it. Um, I've got my flowers here set up and I've got them on a stone which will give them something solid to be on and something quite attractive with all the, the shapes and the nuances of the stone. Notice that I put it up high and that isn't because I'm videoing this today. I've put it up high because I want to be comfortable and whenever you're doing this kind of work, get yourself comfortable because it might take a while and you want to be relaxed, comfortable, you want to be in the moment. So get it nice and high like this, it makes it much easier. Today's camera is the Pentax MX. That's the one I use for a lot of my work. It's a great, solid and reliable mechanical camera. I really like it. And of course, one of the great things about these older mechanical cameras, be they Nikon or Pentax, Canon or many of the others, is they've got fantastic lens ranges and they're very reasonably priced. If you think about it, the technology that worked on for years and years to make these lenses and optimize these lenses, the coatings on them, and of course the broad range that you don't get in medium or large format. You get a much bigger range of lenses for a 35 millimeter. So I've got my 35 millimeter camera here and I've got a macro lens on it. It's the 50 millimeter Pentax macro. It cost me less than a hundred pounds, I think, less than $120. It's a really good lens. One of the advantages of having a macro lens is you can get much closer to your subject. So by getting close enough to the subject, I get the depth of field more narrow and then this is completely out of focus. So all these little hairs and things that the dogs left behind for us will disappear. They'll just go out of focus and my focus will just be on the flowers and the vase and a little bit of the stone. We're talking only a few inches of focus here. So everything else is going to be all blurred out. Now I don't have to get the whole background of the image covered in black. It's fine because I'm going to crop anyway. I'm going to get as much as I can. I'll get the camera in as far as I can to get this picture so big. And you'll see the picture again soon. So you'll see what I mean. I nearly said I was going to crop it then. And that's actually not what I want to do. You don't want to crop if you can possibly help it. Because anytime you crop an image, be it digital or film, you're going to enlarge the grain, you're going to reduce the subtleties of the tones. So here we are, we've got everything set up, but now I need to take a metre reading. And today we're going to look at a little bit different way of doing that. Let me put my recorder, this is my sound recorder that you see me carrying around all the time. Today we're going to use a grey card. 
Now, many of us can't afford to buy spot meters and things like that. We just haven't got that kind of money to throw at photography. But what we can do is a very similar effect using a gray card. And you can purchase these online relatively cheaply, only a few dollars or pounds for one of these. And all you need is a very simple light meter, a reflecting light meter. I've got an old Siconic here that I think I paid 10 pounds for on eBay and it's a perfectly good meter. So making sure that I've got my ISO set properly for the film that I'm using, and remember use your personal film speed for this. So set your personal film speed on the meter. Hold up your gray card in front of your subject, which could be a person, it could be these flowers, um, it could be in the shadows if you're taking a shadow meter reading. Hold it up like this, and then just take a reading with your meter, and then you'll see exactly what to set on your camera. Now this is an average meter reading. In this kind of lighting, I'm not too worried about highlights um, getting burned out because the contrast is relatively low today. I would estimate it at only three and a half to four stops of contrast. So by getting an average reading like that, I'm going to get spot on with my exposure. All right, well, I've got FP4 in the camera. Um, it just happens to be in there. So let's take this photograph and see what we can do with it. I've got the film in the developing tank and I'm going to develop it now. And it's important that you develop your films as quickly as possible after you've taken the photographs because if they sit in the camera for months and months on end, they will degrade. So get the film in a developing tank and develop it. And what you can do, and I've shown this on a previous video, is you can cut the clip of film that you've taken and put that in your tank and develop it. So you can do that in the dark, you can open the back of the camera in the dark, and you can pull out the film that you've already shot, cut it off, and pop it in your tank and develop it right away. And that way you're going to optimize your negatives. Now I'm using FP4, and I'm using FX55, which is a remarkably good developer. And my time for FP4 in FX55 is seven minutes. Now, we've done testing before. I've shown you that testing with this developer. I get an ISO of around 200, and I get six minutes 40 was to the precise time I got. But I decided after printing many of the photographs that I wanted just a tad more contrast, so seven minutes is what I settled for in the end. So seven minutes is my personal development time. Yours might be different if you do the tests. The lighting was a little flat of the subject, so I want to enhance that a bit. I'm going to do N plus development, and that means I'm going to push the highlights of the photograph up by one stop. N plus with FP4 and FX55 for me is eight minutes, that's N plus one. So that's my total development time, eight minutes. I've got a standard acid stop, and I have a alkaline fix, because I always use alkaline fixes, but a, a regular fix will do with this developer and film. No problems with staining or anything, because of course it's not a staining developer. Um, I use alkaline fix, as we've spoken about before, because it washes out of the film much more readily, so it's more archival. So I won't bore you with seeing me develop this. I'm going to develop it now, and then we'll get over to the enlarger and take a look at the negatives. Here are the negatives, and they're looking nice. You may think they're looking a little thin, but actually um, that is not unusual for Crawley uh, developers. He liked uh, thin negatives. He believed that they were less grain and sharper, and I think he's right. And I think we'll see that in a moment when I show you the scans of these negatives. Notice also that I didn't cover the whole of the rear with that black cloth, uh, because we're going to be printing just this area here anyway, so that's fine. So I think they're looking really nice. Um, let's look at them on the computer. I have scanned in the negatives here. I wanted to compare a couple of negatives from this very same shoot um, at the same time on the same roll of film. So there's no difference 
in the timing or camera or anything. These are the same negative roll. But on the left hand side, we have our FX55. And on the right hand side, we have D76. So I wanted to compare them. I wanted you to see the differences. And why I call FX55 a remarkably good developer. Let's zoom in on the left here. Let's just take a look. Focus your eyes on the left hand side and let's look at this. Now it's sharp. There's a full tonal range. Very nice. Look at these areas of the flower here. You've got all the tones, the high tones there of all the petals. It's quite beautiful. And then moving down the bottle and the highlights and shadows and dark areas from behind of the bottle. And look at the grain structure. It's very fine. It's very nice. Now on the right hand side, D76, the grain is more. This, by the way, was D76 full strength because I wanted uh, specifically the grain I was interested in. Would full strength D76 have finer grain than FX55? I think that's an important thing for many of you to know. And in fact, I think you can see that there's maybe slightly more grain in the D76. Now, looking at the flower in this area, you don't have the same breadth of tonality, the petals begin to completely disappear. Whereas on the left, you've still got more definition. So the FX55 has done a great job there in these high tones. Now, as I say, this was taken in exactly the same session. So the lighting was the same. And look at the contrast difference. The FX55 has more contrast than this D76 on the right. This is flatter, it would take a higher grade of paper and I don't know if you'd pull out as much contrast. Now, let's face it, sometimes you don't need contrast. You want a soft negative. And if you were going for softness, D76 might be your answer. For instance, perhaps in portraiture where you want softness in the skin of your subject. But with this flower, I think it demonstrates quite well the difference in the contrast of these two developers. The FX55 on the left has done a great job. Let's move down and just take a look at the bottle. So we can see there's more tonality in this bottle. It's much more tonality there than this, which is graying out. There's still some, but it's not as much. And look here, the highlights here this area of the bottle. The dark tones don't come through as well as they do in the FX55. So all in all, if I had to choose between these two developers, there's no doubt in my mind, I would be looking at FX55, which is of course what I have done. So it's a lovely developer. And I think if you use it, you'll be very, very pleased with your results. Fine grain, great sharpness, beautiful tonality. I don't know if there's more you could ask. This will work as just as well with 120 or, or large format as it does here with 35 millimeter. Very impressive. Very impressive, Mr. Crawley. Okay, let's take a look at the prints. Here is the print from the negative. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this because I think it's something important that you can be thinking about, firstly, when you're setting up your photograph, and secondly, when you get to printing it in the darkroom, because there's something special going on here. Um, this also, of course, applies to digital printing of your negatives as well. In fact, digital printing full stop. It's an important thing to think about. Now, clearly, I have two sizes here. I have a five by seven, and here I have a 10 by 8. So there's two different sizes of the print. And I wanted for you to consider something here. As you look at these two prints, which one do you think is the nicest? And I'm going to let you think about that for a moment. We are so used to printing big. We like to print big. 
there's something about printing big that, I don't know, it, it feels good to have a big print of one of your negatives or of a digital photograph. But there are many times that I think we should think very carefully and consider very carefully what size we're printing at. Now, many of the masters printed small. And the reason they did that was because they made contact prints. So they would lay their negative down on the paper and just shine light down onto it and make a contact print. So they were, in essence, printing to the size of their negative, right? From their large format cameras. And their photographs are stunning. They don't have to be big. Even Ansel Adams, in the early days, printed small. It was only later that he started to make huge mural-sized prints. But when he started, he was printing small as well. Now, there's many reasons for doing this, and I must make a video one day about those reasons. Um, but let's just take a look at this to start with. So this is a 5 by 7 and it's printed on RC, Ilford RC, satin, satin finish. And it's absolutely gorgeous. Look how cute that is. This little print of this little flower in this little bottle. If I bring this closer to the camera, the tonality is sublime. The sharpness, of course, because we're printing small, we're actually getting more because we're not enlarging the grain. We're not blowing the picture up too much. We're keeping it within a certain sizes, within a certain tolerance that I need to talk about in another video. But I love that little photograph. And that in a frame, in a large frame, that little image in a large frame would look gorgeous on my wall. Now this is the size I often print at, 10 by 8. And it too is lovely. You can see that with FX55's fine grain, there's no problems with grain. It's not really starting to show. So it's still very good for 35 millimeter at 10 by 8. But there's something about it that just doesn't look as nice as the little image. And it's nothing to do with the photograph, it's just to do with the size. And I want you to think about that when you're next printing, when you're thinking about how am I going to display, how am I going to view this photograph? I'll turn them the other way around like that so you can see if there's any slight difference in light in this room, you'll get the, the difference. Now you'll see, yeah, I think it might be slightly lighter on the left hand side, um, but the prints are pretty well identical. So very nice. Now I know some of you will like the larger print and some of you might like the smaller. And I'd be really interested if you put your comments below of which one you prefer. But I certainly like to print this one. This one feels right to me. Um, it just, oh, it's just lovely in this nice small format. Now, how did I decide that? You know what? I had to print them both to find out. It was only then that I really knew that I preferred the small one myself. But you might do that differently. You might already always print small or you might always print this size or bigger. Uh, maybe that's your thing. But I wanted you to just consider about when you make your prints, what size should they be? So all in all, I'm very happy with this print indeed. In the developer and film combination is stunning. There's no doubt that's gorgeous. Um, it's faultless. Um, on the enlargement, I set it to grade two. I then made sure I got the right exposure for the highlights. And then the background was slightly lighter than I wanted. So I switched to grade two and a half and that darkened it down to this nice black. So uh, that's how I printed this. Thanks ever so much for watching this video. I do appreciate everyone's support. I really do. Thank you all for buying my book. Thank you all for um, becoming patrons. I really appreciate it, guys. And I look forward to seeing you Friday with my Friday tip.